Hello again, everyone. Welcome back. So this video is the sixth or seventh time I've tried recording this. Um, each has been dropped due to noise or uh, omitting things or just rambling too long. So I'm going to try and keep this as short as possible. But this is actually a video focused on what was basically the winner of the last little informal poll that I put in the comment section. You're going to find the next one in the next video. But this is actually one which I want to go over some of the odder elements to what the life of a union organizer is and can be. Some of it gets into some kind of odd cloak and daggery kind of spy gamey private investigator stuff. And it was, um, well, it got to be kind of interesting. So just to run up a brief, syno brief synopsis of how it is I ended up getting into the position in the first place. Um, over the course of 2010, um, I found myself sort of homeless. Not like living in a box kind of homeless, but couch surfing, no real direction, no real idea what I was going to do next kind of homeless. I'd largely found that the political sphere was something that I was no longer really interested in. The campaigns themselves, they ultimately ended up just being sort of paychecks. And after a certain while, I found the canvas operations, the phone banking, all that shit that I was doing. It felt more like an ordinary job. Now, most of us, if not all of us, are either immediately familiar with or have been familiar with the, the rat race, the grind, uh, the sort of thing where you take a job simply so you can make your bills, you get up, go to work, do the same probably monotonous routine thing day after day, uh, clock out, leave work behind, and then go home to maybe watch some TV, play some video games, or hopefully tune into a particular YouTube channel, <clears throat> hit subscribe. But all the same, when you get there, you know that there, there's sort of set and standard routines. And a lot of people I noticed, including myself back in the day, um, used to really long for something different, something we could be passionate about, a cause we could care about, but also a job which offered us some sense of freedom, sort of individual operation kind of thing. And that's exactly what I found with the union. Now, after working in construction and concrete for the better part of 2010, it was at the end of the concrete factory work that I was doing as a temp worker, where at this job, uh, things such as safety protocols didn't really exist. OSHA and most sort of uh, industrial regulators or watchdogs seldom really got a chance to do anything because the, the owner of the company was simply too rich and powerful um, for them to uh, overcome or defeat. But all the same... After going through one of the more rugged but strangely rewarding labor experiences in my life, I was unceremoniously fired along with the rest of the staff. After the final 10 or 11 hour day we were working, they rang every available drop of labor and effort out of us, sent us home and allowed the temp agency to tell us our services were no longer required. Curiously, and this seems like a matter of pure kismet as it was, serendipity, it was that same day, shortly after getting off the phone with the temp agency, that I found in my email inbox an invitation to apply to be part of the OIT WAVE program with SEIU and train to be a labor organizer to fight for the rights of exploited workers. Sounded fantastic. Now, I signed up and the initial assignment that I was going to be given for the first campaign was actually out in California. I'd never been to the West Coast, so that excited the hell out of me. Unfortunately, because of some paperwork issues and processing issues, my ultimate uh, hiring and deployment was somewhat delayed. And I ended up being sent instead to the first campaign, which was out in southwest Pennsylvania, out by the border of Ohio and West Virginia and the deep tri-county area. Here I was tasked with reaching out to and organizing home care nurses, which required quite a bit of hunting sometimes, both through things like social media, business records, um, places of residence and the like. And in the course of my going out and searching for these people, I found that the, uh, the overall sort of flow of the workday was something I was not entirely used to. This was something maybe I'd experienced once or twice before in different oddball campaigns, such as the one surveillance operation in Massachusetts. But my day would start showing up at a hotel lobby, going through a very quick morning briefing, running over some of the fundamentals and basics of organizing and the ways to go about it, and then taking off in my little rental car and just searching high and low 
oftentimes finding myself in odd ghost towns, former sort of mining towns and rust belt uh, gothic Americana. Other times, too, finding myself in trailer parks where half of them were clearly probably cooking meth, but that somewhere, perhaps if I searched hard enough, I could find one of the care nurses that I was looking for. So in the course of all of this, it wasn't long before I was taken off of this campaign and shot up to Milwaukee to resume the more sort of standard community political organizing, going door to door in low income neighborhoods and organizing a movement against newly elected governor Scott Walker. This was an interesting experience because half of the staff with the OIT campaigns that I'd be on, it was oftentimes a mixed bag. Sometimes they'd be rank and file union workers or former laborers like myself who'd either taken on temporary assignments for the union or become full-time organizers themselves with various chips on various shoulders, with the other half oftentimes being oftentimes affluent, well-to-do leftist new grads, as it was, people who proudly served as interns with the Progressive Caucus on Capitol Hill and that sort of thing. During the campaign in Milwaukee, it was interesting to see how many of them were completely baffled and unfamiliar with what actual poverty looked like, and I noticed it did take a bit of a change within them. But shortly after this and that campaign leading again to the sort of occupation of Madison, which took place in 2011, I was then sent briefly off to Florida for a nurse's campaign, which I was kicked off of two days into it because a certain senior organizer didn't seem to really care for straight white men. This was sort of my introduction to what we later call social justice warriors. From there, I was sent to Minnesota, where I was tasked with trying to organize home daycare workers with this particular comic book villain face dressed usually in a black peacoat showing up in the middle of the day in suburban Minnesota, asking a lonesome housewife whose husband was at work if I could come in and have a conversation about the union she didn't know she could join while it was simply her and perhaps upwards of a dozen children inside. Needless to say, didn't really work, but SEIU wasn't about to let a simple thing like obvious demographic issues get in the way of progress. So finally, after all of these different campaigns, I was sent to one which really mattered. And this was the one in Philadelphia, where I was tasked to organize security workers with the company Allied Barton working on the campus of Drexel University. For those of you not familiar with Drexel, it's a rather substantial portion of the center city area, taking up many blocks of its own, many high rises, and and rather enormous sorts of buildings there. Now, when I'd initially landed, I wasn't really sure what to expect. This time, I'd been sort of doing that door-to-door home-based organizing, nothing really workplace-oriented, not much in the way of fights against management or bosses or union busters coming after me. This is when it all changed. My first day, I was basically just tasked with familiarizing myself with the campus, being sent out, as this would be my defined turf for a while, and just familiarizing myself with the locations, the streets, the traffic patterns, all of this. Now, after what would end up being about a week or two of just basic surveillance, first understanding the terrain and the layout, and then also identifying the key work sites where I'd find the security guards and what their shifts were like and who would be going in and out and what the shift patterns were, it was when I began actually making my approaches to try and have the organizing conversation as I highlighted in the previous video. It was around this time, though, that I also began to learn, firstly, that not everything was as it seemed on the Drexel campus. Unbeknownst to me, it's what we call burn turf. This is to say that it is an area or a workplace which had previously had organizing attempts made, but that for a variety of reasons they failed, resulting in workers losing their jobs, workers losing hours, uh, activists who stepped up in the attempts to build the union being punished for it after the fact when they had no further backing from the local whatsoever. Now, this had occurred five times with SEIU beginning an organizing effort in Drexel and throughout Philadelphia, going after Allied Barton, the largest security company in the city. And then upon making a sweetheart deal between the union brass and this corporate management, dropping everyone in Philadelphia in in favor of preferable arrangements in other cities and letting those workers basically be fired or having their hours slashed or whatever it might have been. I was not aware of this, so naturally it took a little bit for me to actually get these guards to warm up to me. Part of what this entailed was first finding out which older guards had been there and seen this happen before, and work my way back to them through their 
colleagues and comrades in, in, in the company itself. But to begin with, once this surveillance effort of mine, tracking who was where and when and what times their shift was going, I began actually getting some meetings going on, one or two or sometimes three, maybe even four at a time, getting workers to come either before shift to meet at a Starbucks where I'd buy them a coffee and have their organizing conversation, or afterwards meeting in some sort of back corner bar in the little Irish pub tucked just off the main drag. This became a sort of standard routine as I came to know who these workers were, who their friends in the company were, who they weren't so keen on. And it was all going rather well, right up until I was narked out by a younger guard, a new, uh, very young woman working in the library who alerted the company to my presence in exchange for movie tickets. From there, I then discovered that the people monitoring the surveillance camera network, and there are, I believe, thousands of cameras across the Drexel campus, soon began scouring the footage and the active feeds, looking for somebody who matched my description, ultimately culminating with them snapping a photo of me from a, a block away using one of those high-resolution, high-zoom cameras, and then posting that in the office itself, saying that if you see this man, do not talk to him, it could put your job at risk. Now, this didn't deter all of the workers, and pretty soon, using the networks that I had already been establishing and building, I was able to actually discover who was more prone to taking these bribes from the company, as opposed to who might be more receptive to the message. Now, one such guard who was very receptive to the message required something of a rather cloak-and-dagger uh, approach in order to get a conversation at all. This came by way of me determining that a single alleyway just to the south of a street called Spring Garden, from the north of which wasn't the wisest place to go after dark, let's say, that it was in this darkened alleyway that I'd be able to catch him while on patrol, even though he wasn't expecting me, without as much fear of being caught on camera and compromising either my position or his. So there I was in this darkened alleyway, waiting for him in what was an even darker alcove in the back of a restaurant. Now, as he approached, I heard him coming down, and as he passed by me, I called him by name, causing him to jump a bit and pull his mag light out, ready to whoop someone's ass, because who knows what could have been in that alleyway. I emerged from the shadows like some kind of cliché noir detective, identifying myself as a <coughs> organizer with the security union. Pulling back the lapel of my pea coat, I actually uh, showed him this little badge right here, which had been given to me by the union as an identifier. After which he thankfully relaxed a bit, saying he'd been waiting for someone to approach him. And then he took me on the remainder of his patrol, which brought us into a large, secure administrative building that I was clearly not supposed to be in, following him up and down the steps as he did the little magnetized baton thing, which you have to do in security patrols just to verify to the employers that you've done it. And we began talking. And it was around this time that I started learning that these uh, guards, who were making 9 or $10 an hour, um, had recently been reassigned to patrol, foot and bike patrol, north of Spring Garden Street. Now, for those unfamiliar, at least at the time, going north of Spring Garden wasn't something you typically wanted to do. The guards were actually dispatched there because numbers of bobble-headed students attending the college would do things such as uh, late-night walks up north of Spring Garden to the uh, neighborhoods up there carrying their MacBooks in their hands with their earbuds playing whatever their music was, completely oblivious to their surroundings. And this resulted in a number of thefts and assaults and muggings. And once the guards, being paid 9 or $10 an hour, sometimes with no benefits to speak of, began being dispatched to the, these particular areas, well, they started finding that the bike patrols were having their bikes stolen. Numbers of them were being um, assaulted, threatened, and in a couple cases, stabbed. <clears throat> and the company wasn't really interested in doing much to, uh, well, protect them. This was one of the central gripes and the sort of points of ire that I was able to use to polarize him on. And it was from there, at the end of our walk, that I assigned him his first task. Now, in the past, I've referred to these activists as assets. And this is because, at least in the intelligence world, the actual, you know, intelligence world, 
Though a lot of people from films and television might get the impression that there's a lot of that sort of Cold War style uh, secret spy slipping in, taking pictures, sorts of espionage things going on. More often than not, what a good operation will rely on is on the ground assets. People who already know the areas, the players, the people who can go places that perhaps a Westerner might not be able to. We play a similar-ish game in the Union when it comes to intelligence gathering just in the way that I did with him, assigning him the task of sending me photographic evidence of duty rosters, shift rotations, management contacts, employee contacts, and any bit of helpful information he could get me. And he got me quite a bit, sending half of them to what was a first-generation smartphone that I was using, allowing me to actually send that off to my own email to collect a nice spread of these documents. And then also meeting up with me sort of clandestinely on, uh, on his off days or off hours. We'd go out and get a beer. And one time, actually, went out to a gun range just because it was a hobby and a great way to establish rapport. Now, in the building of all this information, unbeknownst to these workers, myself and the other organizers working on the different sites, back at our hotel rooms typically had something of a, of a mapping operation going on. If you've ever watched a crime show or a detective police show, you know that oftentimes they like to build those webs with the photographs and bio information along the wall so they can look at it and understand it. This is what the wall of an average organizer would look like, a series of manila folders with photographs and bio information and shift information about target employees they were looking to speak to, as well as management figures, some who may be, well, bitterly opposed to unionism, some who may be actually passively supportive. All of this information was constantly hung on the wall, and it built up the more I was able to activate these worker assets within the company and get this information provided to me. Now, in addition to this, there was one tactic which I wanted to engage in myself, but really wasn't allowed to, and that's called salting. And I'm just going to go over that really briefly. Salting is actually the act of an organizer basically going undercover, getting a job at one of the work sites that they're trying to organize, and then using their position inside the company to organize it from within. This, again, will require a series of rather secretive meetings and putting people to tests to test their loyalty and dedication. All of these sorts of uh, tricky games all being played out, not even so much just because they could be, but out of raw necessity. Because one of the things I did encounter was union-busting efforts. Now, as I said, I was ratted out by one of the employees in exchange for movie tickets, and there was a number of employees who really didn't see the job as something they'd want to stick with, so dedicating themselves to building a union, risking the job, or even just adding additional headaches to their already busy days didn't seem like something that they wanted. Once management had identified me and put my picture up, I was immediately suggested by an organizer from another union, told to basically either delete or reform my entire social media spread. Now, at the time, I was only on Facebook, and what this ended up uh, resulting in was me changing the name and profile picture, pulling down half of the photos and any identifying information, this being because companies or their union-busting consultancies that they'd bring on board would oftentimes like to dig through social media to find embarrassing photos of you, maybe that drunk photo from a party where you're making a silly face. Or even something, uh, well, just equally embarrassing. And putting that into what was basically a flyer that would go up around the workspace asking, do you want to trust this person with your job? Now, I was able to avoid all of that in just about the time that I began cracking that shell of the burnt turf nature. As, uh, as I began actually getting more people to come out and have conversations, a curious thing occurred. I was pulled aside by the head of the campaign, a man named Neil Diaz, who I would actually find, much in the same way that there was a civil war strike-breaking union-on-union thing going on in California, uh, Neil and his 32 BJ Confederates had actually been named in a racketeering lawsuit by another New York-based union, accusing them of all range of things. Union-on-union warfare is apparently a lot more common than you'd think. But Neil pulls me aside and tells me that I'll no longer actually be in charge of the Drexel site now that things are starting to heat up, and that I was going to be redeployed to a new site entirely, this time going after the guards of a company called U.S. Security Associates. 
Now, U.S. Security Associates at the time was the second biggest security company in Philadelphia. Therefore, it was Allied Barton's biggest competitor. Now, when I was going out to places such as Hanneman Hospital or the mall just on Market Street or the various hotel or apartment building or business complex lobbies, as well as the Navy Yard in Philly where the U.S. Security Associate guards would be found, I found it curiously easy to organize them. They were more than eager to come to meetings, and talking with them, it almost sounded like they'd never even heard of a security union in the first place. It got to a point where I had about a dozen or a dozen and a half uh, of these individual guards on their own time coming down to the union hall sometime at night to sit in and take part in what was a union organizing meeting, and I had them signing cards when the second curious aspect of Neil's little trickery and plan came to, came to, came to be apparent, and this is when he told me he didn't want them signing cards didn't want them joining or forming a union. When I asked him why, it was actually over drinks later that he explained that the plan was to drop them and burn them once another sweetheart deal with Allied Barton was to be made. In this, what I was noticing was that the uh, sort of standard operating procedure of the union local, 32BJ, again, no idea why they named it that. But um, it seemed to me as though what they'd like to do would be to partially organize a site and then play some corporate-style trickery or fuckery on the side to scare the management into a negotiation where they could broker a sweetheart deal which worked out really, really well for the union brass, but usually not so well for the workers they were organizing. Now, I'll get more into what came about as a result of that in the next video, but suffice it to say, I wasn't too keen on this when I discovered what the plan was, and when it was discovered that I had been going back to Drexel, which I'd been instructed and ordered specifically not to, that all the promises that had been made to me about the site being taken care of were nowhere to be seen. It was after this, though, that I was redeployed to New Hampshire, the one place that the Union knew I didn't want to go, and was set on what was a doomed campaign, which ignored actual wage slave workers who needed help, needed contracts, and needed benefits, instead going after research scientists and administrative professionals who were making pretty good salaries with the best benefits package in the state, with the union knowing that this campaign would fail, but that the at-will employment nature of the state would allow them to unceremoniously fire everyone involved as soon as they felt that to be the case. Now, this did come to fruition, but uh, I'll say that the union didn't altogether win that particular fight against me. But again, this is all for the next video, and I appreciate your patience in the creation of this one. I hope that I was able to actually hit all of the points. I think I hit all the points. Pretty sure I did. Either which way, this is going to be the take. I hope you found it somewhat interesting or somewhat entertaining. At the very least, maybe it gives you a bit of an insight as to what the worlds of union organizing really inhabit. The next video will be the last one in this series, but I would like you down in the comments below to let me know, have you ever found yourself in, a, in an occupation or a job where it was, it was just... It was just odd, different, something where it sort of preyed upon your own passion and got you doing things like working 12-hour days when you weren't necessarily required to? Have you ever done things which involve sort of clandestine conversations or sort of shadowy operations? Or have, in the course of your own working, have you encountered union organizers playing some of the games that I've outlined in these videos here? As always, I'm really eager to hear your questions, your comments, all down below. Give this video a like if you enjoyed it, shared it around, offer your thoughts. Don't forget to hit subscribe if you haven't. And if you enjoy this work and the works that I do uh, in addition to this, and you'd like to support the channel and help me continue growing, links down below to things like Patreon, PayPal, all of that helps keep the lights on, helps keep the videos rolling in and out. Hope you've enjoyed it once again, though, and I thank you for coming back. I'll see you in the next video. And I'm still working on my outro. <laughs> Bye. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too. If you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves, to